please. Yeah, because it's beautiful. It's a rainbow for a rainbow day. Happy LGBTQ plus STEM day. Yay. Yay. Yep. <laughs> and there's some nice Twitter action going on right now. Uh, 60th the anniversary. It uh, celebrates the 60th anniversary of a, uh, a rocket scientist, I believe, going to court the Supreme Court in the excited states of America to fight workplace discrimination based on sexual... Based, based on who they are, yeah. which is like fucking crazy. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah. So there's lots of things, uh, featured scientists and all of that good stuff that yeah. uh, that you can uh, check on Twitter today. The hashtag is there, LGBT STEM Day. Uh, I guess they kept the Q out and the 2A, but then anyway, you can find it. Um, and uh, watch your character check limit. it out. Well, character limits, I guess, right? Okay. Um, oh, oh, Jack. Oh, Jack. Jack and the Twitters. Yeah. Okay. Should we go off on a tangent? No. <laughs> Let's not go off. We have a lot to talk about regarding talk bears. About today today is to... barely got enough time. Oh, There's wait, barely wait. enough time for all the puns. <laughs> it's going to be a packed day, and we'll probably not get through all of it, but that's okay. We, we'll just uh... eventually turn off the camera and keep talking about bears. <laughs> Okay, so keep up, pay attention, focus. We're going to talk about bears, but first we're not going to talk about bears. <laughs> first, squirrels. Squirrels. <laughs> let's <laughs> talk about squirrels. But before we talk about ground squirrels, let's remember. Um, let's remember some of the things. So here are some facts for those of you that are mm -hmm. desperately in need of being told some facts that you can hold on to. I hear you. I need facts too sometimes. And so you can take a break because you don't have to do anything on this slide except for just follow along, okay? So where, where do you keep your facts? Where do I keep my facts? In your brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, what we want to talk about is endothermic adaptations to the cold and to managing the cold. And so we left off asking you whether or not there were any freeze tolerant endotherms because if you're thinking about starting to save money to freeze your brain or your body after you pass away uh, you may want to consider whether or not it's even possible or investing in some kind of squirrel scrap scrat like squirrel yeah. that can get frozen <laughs> exactly so are there any freeze tolerant endotherms um, certainly I'm sure you can appreciate that those Oh, you got the door? Thank you. Okay, so that those people that are interested in cryotechnology, there, there's like a whole area of research on this, especially when we're talking about organ transplants and mm -hmm. things like that. That scale works. Yeah, and we're kind of, I mean, we not poking fun, but we're kind of going, in with the benefit of, of hindsight, going looking at like Walt Disney, and we brought that up last week, going, well, it, it wouldn't work. However, understanding this from the perspective of an endothermic species is super important because yep. organ, simply because of organ transplantation, that's right. enormously important. So we don't yet currently know of any actual freeze tolerant endotherms, but there are some strategies that we can explore related to temperature fluctuations of the body. Some kind of bizarre ones. Some kind of unique ones, yeah. So Amazing. what we want to do is we want to talk about them in terms of like the endotherm space of adaptation. And when we do that... It's a warm, fuzzy space. <laughs> it really needs to be a warm, fuzzy space. Yeah. Uh, we need to talk about it in terms of two concepts called torpor and hibernation. And they are kind of related, although... Oh, I got the oh sorry, thanks. <laughs> I keep on like looking to see if there's anybody waiting to get in. Okay. I'm like pushing your hands yeah, away from the door. Yeah, stop opening handle. the door. Okay, so um, we can talk about it in terms of like a, a continuum of physiological processes that are very similar, except there is one key difference related to the time scales of each of these things. So we'll show you how all of that works. But basically, both of them are these decreased physiological states, decreased activity, um, where things uh, that do happen, happen at a lower temperature, but everything happens much more slowly. Uh, and the idea is that um, by decreasing the physiological activity, you decrease the metabolic uh, fuel need, 
uh, which means that you can sort of maintain that level of activity for a lot longer. And so usually you would do this in periods where access to, to food, to fuel, right, to the sort of external sources of heat um, uh, is reduced either at night or uh, over longer periods. So I, I missed out on an opportunity for a pun. I see it. It's Disney on ice. Disney on ice. It's very funny. A plus. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Except there is some difference between torpor, which is generally, well, which is a shorter period of this reduced physiological activity, and hibernation. And the major difference is that with torpor, the animal doesn't experience this sort of major decrease in oxygen within the body. Whereas hibernation, because it happens over a sort of super chronic period, right, months and months usually, um, at least weeks and weeks, um, the body becomes like deplete of, of oxygen. And so the way that the animals wake up from hibernation is slightly different than the way that animals wake up from torpor. So stacking them up side by side, and here we have our little hummingbird who definitely goes into a nightly torpor um, versus you know lots of different rodents um, and uh, other organisms um, that go into hibernation. Also though, we have to keep in mind there is a difference between the hibernation of small animals versus large animals. And again, that's like a body size scale challenge, right? Um, so when we talk about hibernation, the kind of standard uh, is small bodied uh, animals. Uh, and then when we talk about hibernation for large ones, we have to kind of qualify that and go, okay, brown bears, um, or sorry, black bears, very different strategy, right? Because they are a large bodied endotherm. But when we talk about hibernation, we, we talk about it in the context of it being a small-bodied uh, animal. So here they are stacked up. I'm not going to read them to you because you're all capable of reading. Um, but basically, most of it between torpor and hibernation is just an extension of time, right? Or um, an increase, like a, a, a reduction in the temperature of the actual body. So torpor, you have this... This, this fluctuation, this depression in body temperature, hibernation, you have the possibility for an even greater depression um, in, in temperature. Um, but decreased metabolic rates, all of those things come along with it, right? The reheating is where we see um, some of the bigger differences that are um, related to the actual time uh, that the animal has been in um, in that state, that, that depressed metabolic activity state. Um, and that is simply because in order to reheat, you need to start shivering, okay? So your body needs to kind of prime and start kind of moving, your muscles need to start shivering. Um, but in order to be able to shiver, you need to have oxygen in your, in your system. And hibernators tend to be depleted of oxygen within their, their, their tissues. And so before they start even shivering, they need to hyperventilate. They need to oxygenate their body. And so they start hyperventilating, sort of panting, right? Breathing, deep breathing in order to get that oxygen into the system so that they can actually start shivering um, and then burning fat. So as you're going through these notes and looking at the kind of the split here, with the nice pictures to help you think about, kind of hang those things that you're you're adding to your word vocabulary. It's it's time, time, right? That's the biggest thing, and all of the consequences, all the differences between left and right side of this slide here are are essentially having to consequences to deal with how long this has this body has undergone this process. Yeah. Now, burning fat in order to heat up is really important. Um, and there are two types of body fat that we need to consider. Um, we are most familiar uh, with white fat. Um, it's called white fat because it is a lot more translucent. Um, brown fat is a lot darker, okay? So we call them uh, just by, you know, the visual cues. Um, and the cells, though, of these, um, of these fat cells are quite different in their structure and the way that they're composed. 
a white fat cell um, is basically just a warehouse of fat molecules. And we use the white fat predominantly for um, long-term endurance exercise, right? So uh, when you start to go for a jog, for example, it takes about 20 minutes before you actually can start mobilizing the fat from your white fat cells. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in sort of, you know, turning over some of the fat in your body and, 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 and replacing it with some newer fat, that's a great thing to do for your health. Um, but you got to make sure that it's a longer term endurance exercise. So going for a fast walk is better than a 10 minute run, for example, because it takes your body about 20 minutes to start sort of burning the fat that it's taking from your white fat cells. So it's a slow process, right? And that probably wouldn't work. Uh, if we're interested simply in heating up the body, right? We need these like high energy furnaces. To do that, we have brown fat. And you can see that the structure of brown fat cells is very different. It is always in association with mitochondrial rich cells. So lots of mitochondria. The powerhouse of the cell. Ding, 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 ding. And it's actually the mitochondria that make those brown fat cells brown. Right? So there are these little lipid droplets that are in the cell distributed throughout. Um, it's much higher surface area to volume ratio for those fat droplets, which makes them sort of more readily mobilizable. And they don't have far to travel, right? They're going to be burning like right there, right, um, right in those tissues in order to be able to create the heat necessary to raise the body and prime the pumps to then be able to start mobilizing white fat cells. So very different functions of those two fat cells. So just before you go, what you said that going for your 10 minute walk is better than going for a, a 10 minute run. Better in terms of burning fat. A 20 fat minute or, walk. Uh, yeah, yes. better, than, better in terms of burning fat. If you're competing in Japan in the Olympics in like the 5K, don't walk. Yes. <laughs> You'll still get there faster running. Yeah, but you won't burn fat. That's right. <laughs> You'll burn sugar. <laughs> okay. So, Speaking nothing of to do squirrels. with polar bears. <laughs> the Richardson's ground squirrel, if you want to talk about a physiological model to understand some of these different physiological processes, this is the like case study extraordinaire. I'm just reminded that we have a picture of a diorama. And it's, yes. it's, it's not actually that bad. Dioramas, no. the creation of dioramas is a really good, uh, in terms of science, visual science communication, this is telling a story. Telling a story. So yeah. you can see our ground squirrel. And I don't actually think that's a Richardson's ground squirrel. I think that's another species based on the stripiness of it. Um, but they, the ground squirrels that are in this, um, in this very small clade um, exhibit very, very similar behaviors. It's a very exclusive claim. Yeah. You know, where because, they do this crazy thing. Well, no, but check this out. So these guys hibernate. Obviously, you can see their hibernacula here. They make these tunnels. And they kind of curl up into what often can be seen as these, like, little frozen balls, right, over the, over the winter. If you dig them up, that is what they look like, this person that's holding... Uh, this little frozen ground squirrel. They are very non-responsive, um, <laughs> physiologically very reduced. <laughs> um, and if we take a look at some of their sort of physiological profiles, you'll see what's going on uh, in their bodies. So take a look at this. Um, we've got uh, here a graph of soil temperature. So this is the temperature of the hibernaculum, essentially, right? Just outside of, of, not inside their body, but just inside the soil that's surrounding their body. Um, and then we see these temperature profiles starting uh, in the summer months. Um, and so these are all uh, boreal summer months, and so northern hemisphere, um, uh, which means that they are what most of us experience as summer. Um, and so Moving along here, you can see their body temperature is 35 degrees, right? Same with all of the other different uh, cohort classifications, the adult females, the juvenile females, um, and uh, the juvenile um, males. And then some weird stuff happens, right? Their body starts to fluctuate longer and longer periods of time that are going down like this. And then look at this temperature! Oh my goodness! Yeah, can I can I emphasize something here with the cursor? Okay, but okay. Yep. Yep. The underside, 
so that your eye is naturally drawn. I would say focus on the top left, the adult male example here, and your eye is naturally drawn to the peaks, but look at the underside of that curve and think of it as a puzzle piece with the soil temperature. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so what is going on, right? Like, this is an endotherm whose body temperature can get down to here. It's To me, this is like mind-blowing. And what we want you to do is spend just a couple minutes looking at these data um, and um, trying to kind of figure out what exactly the story is. So here's a poll for you. Are you going to mute me in case I talk? I'm going to mute you. I think we need to rebuild this slide. Sure. Because the, the, the life history and the sex differences aren't really their story, but they're not what we're trying to get them to take away. Well, what I really like is, is the difference between the juveniles and the adults. Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we could certainly focus on We could on take adults. away the sex difference and just, just say adult, yeah. co cover the sex, yeah. and just say adult, juvenile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. And then, and then there's a whole bunch of questions that could, like, why is there no data for April and May? Yeah. Um, what's the answer to this question? What's the question? <laughs> Um, the slide says it's uh, the third. Yeah, okay. But certainly, yeah, it's the, yeah. Is that what they're landing on? Yeah. Good. about whether or not they're being disturbed by doing this to them. Oh, yeah. For sure. <laughs> yes. I can imagine. Um, That's interesting. We'll have to make it later. Yeah. Okay. Hello, and we are back. We'll just give you another 20 seconds or so to get your votes in before moving on. Ava Jansen. Okay, great, thank you so much. So 85% of you have joined in. Thank you very much, I'll share the results with you. Um, most of you did get the correct answer. Um, remember, while there may be um, some true statements um, in those um, different options, it's important to recognize what's being shown and depicted in the data itself. Right? So it says, you know, which statement best describes the data in the previous graph and provides a reasonable explanation. Um, and so some of them have information that, that sounds reasonable but isn't being depicted here. Um, and, and the reason why we have those types of questions is because we really want to kind of get you to, to practice, um, you know, interpreting and seeing what is actually there. 
um, and uh, it helps eliminate some bias and things like this as you move forward in your careers, right? By getting you to just hone in on the actual data. Um, we're encouraging all of us to, um, to, to kind of focus on that rather than bringing in other potential biased or other information that isn't actually there. It's so that's why we do it. It's really important that, that what you're taking away from this is what you're reading from the graph. Yeah. Right? Not not what you might have memorized or known beforehand, yeah. and that makes it a much more transferable skill to say, reading news releases about COVID numbers, reading the release versus looking at the numbers. Sometimes in some parts of the world, they're telling you different things. So there's questions in the chat. Uh, does this mean that squirrels have lots of brown fat? Yes, it sure it does. It sure does. That's a great yeah. inference from that. That's right. From that figure. That's right. So you would predict then uh, that those animals that are in need of these, you know, sort of dramatic increases in body temperature over short periods of time as they're, you know, awakening out of torpor or out of hibernation would be much more likely to have more brown fat. Um, the other thing that you can um, infer from this is that smaller animals that have a larger surface area to volume ratio also have more brown fat. And so what we do know is that younger animals, when they're smaller, have more brown fat than older animals when they're larger. So babies, human babies, have more brown fat um, that are sort of tucked around vital organs like their hearts uh, in order to keep them warmer because they're losing more heat through their skin uh, than an adult would. Adults do have some brown fat, but not anywhere near what a younger, um, a younger mammal uh, would, uh, would have. So, why hibernate? And if you'll notice, why have these very short duration spikes increase in temperature? just for you know less than a day a couple of hours and then go crashing back down this is body temperature that's spiking every couple of weeks right and why and there's can i there's somebody yeah. who's noting in the in the chat that the duration of that low temperature if you look at the valleys that they increase they in increase. length as the season yeah. goes on yeah so I don't know if you've noticed, if you uh, grew up or are currently living in a place that has long periods where there is snow on the ground and squirrels, you may notice that squirrels, like the, like the, the ones that we see, right, the tree squirrels, not, not the ground squirrels, but like the gray squirrels and the black squirrels and the red squirrels and all of those things, they, you know, hide in little, little, um, little nests. You see them in the trees, in the bare trees, these big sort of balls of leaves that they've built for themselves. Um, and uh, they do come out every once in a while, right? Um, but they do spend extended periods in those nests during the winter. So it's kind of a hibernation, but they also wake up, but why? And so everybody's been wondering this, everybody who cares has been wondering about this, why the spike? So um, this is a terrible, again, we have to increase the, the um, resolution of this. But basically, what researchers think the reason is, is so that they can clean their bodies um, for just a little bit and then go back into this reduced state. And so in order to you know, clean your body of, of viruses, of parasites, it's an, like to, to launch an immune response, uh, you need to be at a warmer body temperature, right? For all of those enzymes to work um, and uh, for, for everything to kind of clean house and then you shut back down again. And that's what they think it is, that it's basically uh, like reviving for a couple of hours, clean everything up, and then go back into this, into this reduced So again, state. thinking about biological levels of hierarchy, this is, we're talking about animals, organisms in populations, but we're in ectotherms versus uh, today talking about endotherms. But this is a real limitation or a described behavior, set of behaviors for a species that's based on enzymes. This is a limitation that the enzymatic systems in ectotherms are not limited by, that they can keep doing things at low temperatures or at ambient temperatures. Thanks. Okay, so now let's think about large animals that are also going to hibernate. And we'll make a bridge from squirrels to polar bears via black bears in Algonquin Park. Rocks. <laughs> Do 
we'll get uh, somebody to make up the drugs. How about a double dose? Sometimes they need a double dose. I think we should go with a double dose. <laughs> okay, we'll see how the first one works. No, let's just double it up. <laughs> What's this called? Jab stick. The jab stick. Yeah. This is a real technical operation, isn't it? <laughs> Got the shovel and the jab stick. You'll have your shovel ready. Oh, I'm my shovel is ready. <laughs> In case she tries to come out. I hit you and run. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. There we go. Okay, time. This is one of those moments that if something goes wrong, everyone will say they had a coming. And it's my job to go in there and get those cubs? Right. In a few minutes. They're quite young cubs. Their eyes are not open yet. So they're only about six weeks old. I think there's three. You're right, there's three. Do you know how I could tell? How's that? You could count. Count the heads. <laughs> Grab her by the ear and tug on it just to see this, whether she responds. Pull on the beer's ear. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you, I think you're good. Okay. Okay, number one. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> how cute is that? Ready. Okay, little beer. And another one. Goodness, is that the cutest thing ever? Hello, little bear. Rick, I think, I think what we should do, okay, Rick, Okay, yes, what is, do we do uh, now? I think you should pass the cubs over to No, you. no. <laughs> well, you're going to help me get mom out now. Okay, no. <laughs> no? Yes, okay. Can I name them? Uh, well, you don't encourage that, do we you? We number them, Rick. I'm going to so. name them. <laughs> the screaming one is Danny Williams. <laughs> you change the collars every year? Yeah, their batteries last about a year. Okay, thank you. So just screw the things off? Yeah. Now we have to send that to Ottawa because Stephen Harper needs it for Jim Flaherty. <laughs> Keep an eye on it. All his ministers wear these. <laughs> this is government edition. There she comes. One, two, three. Oh. Now we have to weigh this guy? Just put him inside the bag. Put him down in the Loblaws bag. What's he weigh? So he weighs 1.5 kilograms. Okay, shush, 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 we're going to measure your head. Are Canadian bears the only ones with universal health care? <laughs> oh no, look at that. Oh! Okay, let's go back. That's it. Here's your new collar. Same as last year's model, except it carries way more songs. <laughs> I can't believe I have two baby bears. Oh, this one's breastfeeding. Each one of them is with one arm. Nice and slow. There you go. I can see why magicians work with rabbits. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay. That's a big 145. One, two, three. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Tuck the cubs under against her chest. And put her right up against her teeth. Yeah. And then you can put all three right in there. Okay. Do I have to put three back? Yes. I can't keep one? No. Just under my jacket on the helicopter. <laughs> Just her left front leg and put them on her all right, chest. Come on. There you go. Number two. There we go. Come on, Danny. Oopsie daisies. In you go. Okay. And number three. Okay. Bye-bye, bears. Bye-bye, bears. Okay. Time to get out of here before Mom wakes up. Now we're going to close off the entrance with branches. Okay. Thank you, Marty, sir. Very right. That was an incredible day. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We came, we saw, we protected the species. You're watching the Mercury Board on the CBC. Shh. Yay! Okay. I hope you can see that. Uh, we'll have the, uh, the, the... It's a longer, much longer clip, so we'll have that uh, link for you uh, so you can go and watch it, maybe in less stunted uh, delivery. Um, but yeah, science, right? And big endotherm hibernating. And so... The biggest difference here is because of body size, they can't 
have their temperature go down anywhere near the Richardson's ground squirrel, but also not anywhere near sort of a more typical uh, hibernator. Large body size means that if your body temperature goes down 10 or 15 degrees Celsius or even more, you're not going to be able to raise it fast enough in order to be able to not die in the process, right? Die while waiting. Um, so what happens with the large endotherms is that they do have some metabolic depression, of course, but their temperature doesn't go down as dramatically. It goes down a few degrees, maybe five or six degrees. Okay? And this is important because if you're looking at temperature profiles, um, you should be able to tell whether something is a large body size or a small body size based on the degree to which um, the temperature goes down. So you can kind of, I'm sure you can kind of see where we're going with this in terms of the final exam, try graphing these things, um, and see kind of what some of the differences are. Now, remember, as an endotherm, when you're going you through... Your tags or what is only a five degree, we've just said, a five degree temperature change, that's still dramatic. That's yeah. still much bigger than endotherms who don't hibernate. That would be an impossible thing. So this is on a continuum of, of torpor to hibernation, body size, and time. This is still a dramatic physiological change. Right. And what does this have to do with polar bears? Not much. Nothing, because polar bears don't hibernate. <laughs> because... There's a lot going on in the winter, and if they missed out on the opportunities to hunt during the winter, they would die. There wouldn't be polar bears. So polar bears have a completely different strategy associated with um, surviving in the cold. Take a look at them, first of all, their temperature profiles. They don't lose a lot of heat through their skin or their fur right? They have thick, thick layers of all sorts of things, very thick coat in order to be able to keep warm. And most of their heat is lost through very tiny crevices that they really can't, you know, add fur or fat to. So you've seen figures, this kind of a thermal imaging camera image before, and there were some, actually a lot of questions uh, in the chat about what the colors were meaning. So, so what you're seeing there, just to go over it again, is that most of that, that bright yellow orange, that's where the heat's escaping where it's cool and closer to the ground color, what you're basically seeing is that that part of the bear on the outside of the fur, it can yeah. go down to that temperature because of the adaptations that we'll talk about. And it turns out that if you're flying in a helicopter over the Arctic doing thermal imaging, trying to find polar bears, you won't find no. them. They don't show up. They look so, like ice. Oh, go off and write uh, the Predator <laughs> sequel where polar bears take on Predator and nice. can effectively hide by doing this. <laughs> Yeah, so adaptations, like a whole wheelbarrow full of adaptations. I wanted to swear there, but I didn't. Are you proud? Uh, yeah. I, I like it more when you swear. Okay. <laughs> so lots of adaptations. These things are amazing at surviving really, really cold temperatures. And even when it gets really cold, they still curl up into a ball, very much unlike the muskox, who just stands there. So the muskox is even more sort of you know, covered in all sorts of really great jackets, but the polar bear is pretty darn good. Um, it's got very thick fur. Um, it's got uh, hollow spaces uh, in order to be able to uh, insulate with air pockets. Um, it has very small ears, reduced snout as well, um, and lots of fur between the toes, very thick fat layer compared to other bear species, and all of these things allow it to maintain its body temperature. So here's the list. Um, it's also much bigger, so much less surface area to body size or body volume ratio. What do you mean hollow spaces? Spaces. Spaces. Of air. Of air, right? Hollow. Like in the shaft of the fur, right? Yeah. So that air, obviously, um, you know, can, can help regulate the temperature uh, across um, uh, from the outside of the fur to uh, the skin, right? By having these sort of warmer pockets of, of air, um, it can help to regulate the, the cold exposure of the skin. So when we're talking about polar bears and we're talking about bears of the north, there's, of course, not just polar bears. There are, uh, which is here, Ursus mar maritimus or maritimus against Ursus arctos, or these black, or these sorry, these brown or grizzly bears. 
And people have been interested about the differences in the shared hist evolutionary history. We're, again, we haven't abandoned ecology and evolution in the physiology unit. We're going to actually now show you in a couple of seconds some increased frequency of phylogenetic trees in the physiology unit. Yeah, because it's all related. Now this is kind of crazy when you look at this. Take a look. This is a, a phylogeny that is simple and older than most of you. <laughs> um, and it used a very small snippet of mitochondrial DNA. But what it showed was two clades. On the top, you've got the brown or the grizzlies. On the bottom, you've got the polar bears with one population in Alaska or on these isolated islands of brown and grizzly bears. So take a look at this, right? You have three populations of polar bears that is a sister taxa with this brown bear population. And then all of this is sister taxa with all of these also brown bears. These are Ursus arctos, so same species as Ursus arctos here. So when we're talking about sister taxa here, remember this is a these are individual these are populations within the same species that yeah. that you're looking at. So two clades that nominally should be two species, two clusters, and then we have Strangeness. Strangeness. I hope you see the strangeness. I think you can see it with the brown bear in the white bear clade. Yeah. Okay. Now we've done more because t time has continued and the strangeness has continued. So you've got the long outgroup at the top there. That's Americanus. That's the black bear. That's Rick Mercer and his black bear in Algonquin Park. And then if you jump down to the smaller, more closely related groups, you'll see there are still uh, different populations of brown bear and then a lot of polar bears oh, sorry. go back. So that one of the neat things about this is that people have done more and more DNA work. This was the last slide was made with about 160 base pairs, just a very small snippet, and that was technologically very advanced at the time. This is with whole mitochondrial genomes, so 16,000 more than up to 20,000 base pairs, and including this one, which is a kind of a special one because. It is from this jawbone, which was dug out of a little part of the western edge of Svalbard in Norway. And it's a mandible. They extracted DNA from this mandible that was very well preserved and had one kind of canine tooth, suggesting it came from an adult bear. But they think it was between, based on the other elements they're finding in that strata, that layer, was more than 100,000 years old. And so it lets you, using ancient DNA and the DNA of contemporary populations, lets you compare and contrast how much variability there is now versus then. And if you go back, you'll see it's clustered right in there. In this, in this mitochondrial view of bears, this says, okay, polar bears, they, they've looked kind of like this for a while. And it hasn't yet answered the brown bear question, which is still, to simplify it, is here. So we've simplified it for you. This, this is the simplification, right? So if we take a look, common ancestor, it was a bear, right? Um, brown bears over here. And if we went even further down, black bears would be uh, an outgroup, right? Along this particular line. It's bears as far as the eye can see. Bears everywhere, right? So brown bears elsewhere. Brown bears, Algonquin Park. And then here, uh, is a common ancestor that is shared between the polar bears and another population of brown bears. So WTF, right? Like, are brown bears basically on the ABC islands? Or is this a different species? No, it's not, according to all sorts of ways. Of, yeah, and 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 the way that they see themselves, they interbreed, they do well, they tend to. But so take a look at the distribution, though. That's what the other, the triangles and the diamonds and the squares that we've got. Brown bears, all or circumpolar ground bears. And then polar bears all over the place as well. Hudson Bay, far, right. far north of, of Europe and, and, and Russia. So where are the ABC islands? Right here. ABC. Okay. What's going on there? One, yeah. two, three. Um, these are the ABC islands. And it turns out then the interpretation would be that the brown bears of the ABC islands are more closely related to polar bears than brown bears elsewhere. Right? And that's super cool. Mm -hmm. Let's dig in a little bit further with a poll question for you. And in fact, you know what, I'm going to, because everyone can see that, I'm going to go back 
so that they can see the um, yeah, yeah. super. We're looking for the not valid interpretation. Lots of questions in the chat coming Yay. up to the things that we're talking about. <laughs> I like that. Can the can a pit viper see a polar bear in the snow? I think that's a song lyric. That's a great. One. <laughs> That's how Predator would do it. Yeah. A little sealy fart. Because <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't be able to cover their butt because they're doing this. <laughs> That'd be a great exam question. The if farting the polar, polar bear. bear. In the, in the, on the ice, can, you... can Predator kill it? We're all over the place here. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay, just a few more seconds. This is good. This is a challenging question. So we like that you're challenged by it. Okay. Okay. I'm going to end it here and okay. share the results. There you go. Um, the answer is this one here, D, polar bear lineage is paraphyletic. Um, and so that is not supported. And the reason why it is not supported is that it's actually the brown bear lineage that's paraphyletic, not the polar bear uh, lineage. Um, so just be careful with that. Um, the polar bear lineage um, starts potentially here, Draw a little right? Line. There it is. Yeah. Um, the brown bear lineage, though, starts over here, and that is most definitely paraphyletic because the polar bears are, are involved here. So just be careful. The other way that you can go about it is by looking at all of the other things. Mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited, inherited so this tree could result from hybridization of polar bears and brown bears. The answer is yes. So we haven't talked specifically about mitochondrial DNA, so don't worry about you know whether if you indicated that it's it's not a big deal. We're gonna we're gonna teach you that stuff now. Um, polar bears could re-evolve from bound bears. It is technically possible given that the common ancestor here um, was, was a brown bear, right? Um, because here it may, it may not have been a brown bear, um, but certainly if we have brown bears that are a spe 